Welcome back to the Spirit of Success. I'm your host, Yara, and on today's episode, we will be discussing careers related to composition and music. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with award-winning, prolific, and beloved composer, producer, and musician, Mr. Jack Lenz. Mr. Lenz is a multi-award winning composer, producer, and musician who has written, performed, and produced music for film, television, theater, and non-soundtrack albums. He has also performed and toured as a musician with well-known and acclaimed music groups such as Loggins and Messina and Seals and Crofts. Some of his most popular music compositions and works include the music he created for Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ, Hallmark's Good Witch, 90 Minutes Live with Peter Gazowski on CBC, and the movie Mona's Dream, which follows the story of Mona Mahoudinejad and the persecution of Baha'is in Iran. He is the founder of Lens Entertainment, a world-renowned film, television, and music production company that provides diversified creative service to the entertainment industry, and the founder of Live Unity Enterprises, an organization devoted to production of music for the Baha'i community. Throughout his career, Mr. Lenz has dedicated and continues to dedicate his work to serving and raising awareness about the human rights problems and crises around the world and continues to leave a big impact globally. Welcome, Mr. Lenz. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you, Yara. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for being on the show today, and I'm super excited for our conversation. Before we get into the details of your career, we would love to know what got you into music and composing, and how did you get your start? Uh, well, I started uh, studying piano when I was just uh, a teenager, and uh, I was from a little town in Saskatchewan called es Eston, Saskatchewan, and then uh, my parents moved to the city of Saskatoon, which was a little bigger city, and uh, there I was able to study piano, and uh, I eventually went and, and uh, studied uh, music and composition at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And uh, you know, it, it's it's a it's a great memory for me because uh, I was allowed and encouraged by my parents, and I think that's a big big uh, thing and an important thing uh, to pursue uh, a career as an artist and as a musician. Uh, even though they don't, they didn't. My parents didn't know anybody who made a living at music or who'd ever had any success with it. So it was a sort of a big jump and. Um, and it was around the same time that I that I encountered the Baha'i faith. So that those two things of just sort of deciding to to work as as a musician and develop myself as a, hopefully as a songwriter, a composer, uh, to develop the skills to do that, then to try to figure out how I could make a living, and sort of, and becoming a member of the Baha'i faith was sort of happened all at the same time. <laughs> so it, it was a uh, actually a very inspiring time for me because the the a high community that I was from in Saskatoon uh, was in a sense, in many ways, an, uh, like an arts community. So it was a very supportive community of people pursuing creative work as, as, a, as, a, as a real thing, as a profession, as a way of um, making your way in life, you know, and also from an early, I guess, probably an early age playing in, in bands and being part of uh, music groups, which is also a way of developing uh, as an artist, not just as a musician, but also as a writer. How wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. And so with that, what messages and values do you try to promote through your compositions and music? Well, I think the kind of the key thing for me is um, that music and art are, are primarily and have always been inspired by spirituality, by religion. Uh, there's a great book by Leo Tolstoy that I would encourage every creative person, uh, and I think basically all people are creative, so I'd be encouraging everybody to read an essay by Leo Tolstoy called um, um, What is Art? And it's just a small booklet, it's not very big. Uh, it's it's not quick reading because it's very dense, but he says that all, all great art and all universal art is, is uh, really inspired by a religious impulse. He uses that phrase of religious impulse. So a, a longing to understand you know, your origin, where you came from, what's important, what's most important in life. Um, these are the things that I think really uh, are, 
are part of what drives people to create, to express, try to express beauty, to try to inspire others. And, uh, and I think that the other thing is, is that the whole concept of, of uh, what I call, I actually, I actually wrote this down, <laughs> uh, a confidence in the immortality of the soul, right? Um, the question of where we go after we die is important to every single person. And, you know, how, how does music, how does art um, address that issue of immortality and what happens to us when we die? Uh, and that's always been interesting to me ever since I, uh, I was a young person. That was a, a big question for me. And so uh, finding, finding a way to express that through music and thinking and making a connection that actually music is inspired by souls in the next world that are in a very pure state and that they have a capacity to inspire um, ideas, melodic ideas, um, um, all, all of those things, lyrics, all of it. Everything has uh, a purpose. And the, the greatest purpose that it can achieve is to have a sense of cohesion and unity between elements, right? So um, I always used to think music is the same thing. It's when, when you uh, actually communicate with people through music and musicians play together, it's a very subtle thing. But if they're not unified in their understanding, if they're not unified in their approach, if they're playing from a different songbook, uh, the music won't sound good. <laughs> yeah. so it's a simple analogy, but it's, it's true that music really represents unity on a very high level. Right? Yeah. I think those are all very important things for us to think about both as when you're listening to music and for people that are creating music. Um, one thing we had talked about in a previous episode um, was that the, the human mind, the human um, psyche is always longing for rhythm and longing for cohesion and unity of some sort. And that's something that we find through music like you were talking about. So it's an interesting thing to think about. And at first it's not something that comes to the forefront of our minds. I don't think when we're listening to music but it really just shows how deep an impact music has and yeah. that it can have on people and how it's something that's so naturally part of us as people. Yes. Um, so talking a little bit about your experience as a musician, um, and I think maybe a little bit prior to your work more so as a composer, um, you had worked with a number of groups and performed with them, recorded, toured, um, as we had mentioned in the beginning, one of them being Seals and Crofts and uh, the other being Loggins and Messina. Can you tell us a bit about your experience working as a musician and how these and other experiences as a musician inspired your composition work and your desire to become a composer? Yeah. Well, I think when you work with people who have established their greatness as writers, uh, which is what I experienced as a very young person being around people like Kenny Loggins and Jim Messina, being around Jim Seals and Jimmy Seals and Dash Cross, um, I, I learned very quickly that being in that environment was a great opportunity and encouragement to really try to study how it is that they thought, <laughs> how it, what their process was in writing. And even Jimmy Seals used to say that, you know, you should always play music with people who are better than you because it will make you kind of pull up your socks and hopefully be, be better yourself. So there's a great truth to that. And for young people now who ask me about the study of music, and, and even, even as, a, as a principle of education, I think it's important that we encourage people to study greatness. And it's not a simple question because, or a simple idea, because if, you, if you're going to study greatness, you have to try to understand in yourself how do I measure that? How do, how do you measure greatness? How do you measure something that has excellence, right? If you're working from a standard where you've had no education, it's pretty difficult for you to measure greatness. You might measure it by economics, right? Oh, that person is very wealthy, therefore they must be talented. But you find after a while that those standards are unique in that they, 
they represent uh, not just virtuosity, but virtue. <laughs> they, they represent uh, excellence of expression, not just uh, people thinking that it's wonderful when maybe it's not so wonderful. <laughs> You know, we, we, we've set up a standard in music whereby we consider fame to be the, the standard. And it's just, it, it, it's, it's not an enduring standard, right? Because fame like money, like anything um, material evaporates eventually. So what is, it, what is it that then can be a standard of the study of greatness? So I think, for example, people should study they're going to study music, they should study Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, because the music has endured for centuries. So if you study that, that, that's a very good start. That's a very good foundation. I think people should also study great songwriters. So I think it's valuable to study the, the, composers of the 30s and 40s and 50s of the 19th century, or the 20th century, sorry, the George Gershwins and the Sammy Kahn's and the, oh, just incredible, um, in, in incredible, uh, Irving Berlin. You know, there, there's, there are all these standards of people who wrote really enduring melodies, very wonderful, emotional and clever lyrics. You know, um, the, a lot of those songs had a lot to say. Uh, they were certainly songs that became popular. Um, and now sort of e even from the mid uh, 20th century, if you look at, at uh, the work of Joni Mitchell, you look at the work of, of uh, Paul McCartney and, and John Lennon, if you look at the work of um, uh, Paul Simon, um, you know, it, it, it's hard, it's hard to, it would be difficult to say that Bridge Over Troubled Water is not a great song. <laughs> you know, there, there are so many great examples of people who, who really deserve to be studied because of their melodic and lyrical content, but also the, the value of their, their capacity as singers. You know, singer-songwriters are, are a unique model because they not only can they sing, but they express from their hearts and from their minds and from their experience, uh, lyrics and melodies, which really are enduring. Yeah. And oftentimes they say that those songs just kind of flowed through them, that they found some, uh, some source of inspiration that they didn't necessarily understand. So all these things are at play in the study of greatness. Right? You have to be able to figure out why is it great? <laughs> and then once you determine, you know, within hopefully a universal standard um, and not just North American music, not just uh, European music, but uh, music from uh, other wonderful cultures to understand why it's great and then what's great about it. Why has it endured? Why does it continue to have a powerful emotional effect on, on people, right? And I think those those are the things that we need, you know, kind of to certainly as a, as a as a person that writes music, those are my always my first questions: is is it is it true? Is it authentic? And does it does it meet any of those standards that I've studied that represent greatness? To have both that natural inspiration, whether it comes from your background, your own experiences, the messages that you want to relay through your music, but being able to have that basis of what makes music great and what makes music have an impact on people and what has it, what form has it taken in the years past that has allowed it to be popular for its impact um, are really important things to be able to put together a song that meshes your messages, that's authentic to you, that's unique to you, that also combines the musical knowledge and the musical expertise of the past that you've seen that works, that is able to convey a message. Yeah. And I think, I think the other thing that I can't and, 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 and shouldn't leave out of that is the influence of poetry and the influence of poetry meeting music. Uh, you know, we, we have a Canadian called Leonard Cohen 
who's written some very enduring songs and very powerful songs in terms of the impact that they have on your mind and your soul. And because of his lyrical ability and his musical ability, um, those, those songs uh, w will endure, right? And uh, they, they have an effect on people because they kind of bridge the, the sacred and the profane. <laughs> You know, he, he's, um, and, and, and poets have done that for centuries where they, um, I, I've always been very influenced by the Persian poets, even before I knew about the Baha'i faith. Rumi was a, was a poet that I'd always loved because I felt like uh, even though it's 12th century poetry, it seemed to transcend time. It seemed to be able to reach deep into your, into your thoughts and your consciousness about, about what and why this music uh, and this poetry was enduring. Right? Yeah. So I, th I think that's, that's the other element because in a sense, songwriters are often uh, poets. And there's a great Arabic tradition that says that the mysteries of God are on the tongues of the poets, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think that they, they deal with those mysteries, the mysteries of relationships, the, the mystery of, of love, the mystery of of you know origin where we come from where we're going yeah. it, it, the the poets uh, speak to those issues and speak to the issues of character what is your view on the impact that music should have on society and how does this perspective align or differ from music's current impact well that's such a, a complex question <laughs> i think the you know i i I had a wonderful teacher in university named Otto Rogers, and he was also my, my Baha'i teacher. He introduced me to the Baha'i faith. Um, and he was a wonderful um, fine art painter. But more than that, he was a wonderful person. And so um, he, he always used to talk about entertainment being kind of the foundation of the relationship of art to people. It was a, a sort of a common ground that people would be entertained by artistic and creative expression. And secondly, if it, if it reached the next level, then it was fulfilling a, a greater purpose of art and music, which was to enlighten people. In other words, that you would learn something. You would, your, your mind would be enlightened uh, by, by that, that creative expression. The third level and the highest level of the impact of music is empowerment, right? Because what do we seek in our lives? We don't just, we, we, we soon realize that, that this is a difficult world and it's a toilsome world and many people suffer very greatly. So the, the heart of, uh, of an artist should be a heart that's open and receptive to the feelings of others, right? So then that empowerment that can come through art or music is something that then can inspire people to action, to changing themselves, to changing something in their society that needs to be changed, to addressing injustice, to addressing the great needs of humanity to achieve something better than what we're currently experiencing, right? So that's, that I feel is really, it maybe sounds a little trite to just say, oh, it's entertainment, it's enlightenment, it's empowerment. But if you think about the journey of a person, any person in this world, that you can deal with life in a very material way where the, you, maybe all you think that's important is your material well-being. But, but you'll eventually ask yourself a question, what else is there? What else can I, can I do? Because that life after a while might not be satisfied. So then if you think, start to think to yourself, well, maybe I need to know and understand more. Well, that's the movement towards <laughs> enlightenment. You know, we, we use the, his, the example of history where we literally went from the dark ages. If you look at the history of 11th, 12th, 13th century, within a couple of centuries where somehow we were in the Renaissance. Right? And I have lots of uh, thoughts about w w what that transition was and how it happened and the influence of Islam on Europe, for example, but, and Islamic thinking and scholars. 
But I think that the Renaissance was also a flowering of Christian civilization, even though, though it had gone through such a dark period in the Middle Ages. So somewhere in there, you can see that there's movement towards enlightenment and that, that that's also a personal process for each person. But past enlightenment is what you do with it. What do you do with knowledge? What do you do with feeling that you've learned something? You try to put it into action. And art has the capacity to empower people to social change, actually becoming not just aware, but to act in such a way that you have through service, through love, through fellow feeling, through being able to kind of communicate important issues to people, to try to educate. All of that can result in empowerment and, and that social, viable social change. And I don't, you know, I may be biased, but I think that music and art are the highest, are not just the highest, it's the, the best way to accomplish that shift from perhaps ignorance or, you know, acceptance of the status quo to becoming enlightened and more knowledgeable, and then putting that knowledge into action and accomplishing something great. I definitely agree with that. I think music um, and the arts in general are one of the best, if not the best ways to be able to make an impact on our society for personal change, for changing communities, for a change on a global scale. And I think that was all very beautifully put. One thing that we've noticed and that I think we're beginning to notice more is that behind every great movement, behind every change in, in history, um, there's music behind it. There's always an anthem of some sort. There's a movie of some sort. There's some type of art that comes out of that time period or that is representative of that time period where a great change occurs. And I yeah. think that just shows how integral music is to creating those shifts and changes in thinking. And so with that power that music has that I think is sometimes beyond human understanding, um, it really has the power to change the world. And we see that it is doing that. So those are all very important things to keep in mind. And just remember as we keep on making music. So one of the most popular films for which you have composed is Mel Gibson's Passion of Christ. The film covers the last 12 hours of Jesus Christ's life before his martyrdom. What inspires you to be a part of this movie? And can you please share with us your experience working on and composing music for it? The answer on part two of Composition and Music with Jack Lenz. Be sure to tune in to The Spirit of Success on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out. Bye!